the level. Anybody believe they're in the right place at the right time with an awesome God, a sovereign God? While you're standing, I want to draw your attention to a passage of Scripture. And it is not an unfamiliar passage of Scripture. Some of you may even have this memorized. I want to be hotter in the monitors, please. But it's out of Psalm 23. This is a song, a psalm of David, and there's a lot of insight in it, and I think it's going to really be a, a good foundation for the conversation that we're going to have this morning. And I believe that God's going to give you tools today that will help you to maximize life and to materialize everything that God has placed on the inside of you. How many of us know that, that destiny happens by the renewing of our mind, right? The, the only thing that's keeping us from where we are and where we hope to be is transformation. That is it. As the song said, it is settled. It truly is settled. It's sealed in heaven. And those moments are going to come together and kiss each, kiss each other. And those are called destiny moments. And I'm going to help you to be prepared for those moments as we, as we press in today. And so, so let's, let's look to Psalm 23. You know, you can read it along with me if you know it. The Lord is my shepherd... I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. If you believe those words and that's your testimony, let's just honor and celebrate the one who makes that all possible. Now, we're going to go to God in prayer. The, th the thought for the day that we're going to work around, and we'll be on this at least two weeks, and that thought is the power of the present moment. The power of the present moment. Father, thank you so much for this moment that you brought each of us in, this present moment that, that you have blessed us with. And Father, we want to take our attention and turn it towards the person who's next to us. Lord, we know that you've got us covered. And since we know that you've got us covered, we want to take our intercession and we want to put it towards the person that's next to us, in front of us, and around us. God, will you please bless them? We don't have a poverty mentality. We, we don't have a, a deficiency mentality, which we'll talk about. We know you've got us. And since you've got us, we can, we can direct our attention and our hopes towards the person who's next to us. Bless them. Open doors for them. Close doors if necessary. Provide in supernatural ways. Heal their hearts. Align them. Restore them, for this is who you are. And God, I thank you for the spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge and insight. I thank you, God, that you're going to make me in this moment a master teacher for your glory. A master teacher, God, that I might build up these incredible, priceless creation of yours, these creations of yours. And so, God, give me words that make me an architect, that they might be built up and cause them to be everything that you've created them to be. And, God, we decree that we're not going to leave here the same. Hallelujah. We're going to go to another level of glory. We're going to go to another level of joy. We're going to go to another level of wholeness. We're going to go to new heights of creativity. We're going to go to another level in love. And we're going to be better as a result of these moments that we spent together because you were here. And we believe for these things in the matchless and mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Just do me a favor. Greet somebody before you take your seat. Just love on them. And we're going to get into this thing. Hallelujah. Let the love flow. I feel it. Yeah. God bless you. Thank you for praying for me. Thank you, Lord. Mm. There are, as we're getting comfortable here, there, there are 
themes, spiritual themes, that are often hard to grasp. And one of those spiritual themes that, that I believe that are hard to grasp is the understanding of what I like to term alignment. And alignment has to do with you and I coming into agreement on earth what has already been settled in heaven. And so we're talking about two different planes. There's a passage of scripture, I talk about it all the time, I wrote about it in my first book, Purpose Awakening. If you've been a part of our movement, somebody liked that book. I promise it wasn't a shameless plug, although you can get it in the merch line. Uh, um, no. No, what I write about, I write about alignment, and alignment is, is, you know that passage of scripture in Jeremiah 1, where it says, before I formed you in the womb, before I put you in your mother's womb, I knew you. And then it goes on to say, I, I ordained you to, in that context, it was to the prophet Jeremiah and about what he would be. And in that context, he was ordained to be a prophet in the earth. And so that's a very mysterious passage of scripture because God says, before I even caused you to be conceived naturally, I fully knew you spiritually. That's kind of that, that, that. That's not an easy pill to swallow, but it does let us know that God, in the providence of God, there is at least two planes that we function in. Because when he talks about that, he says, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you, right? That's one plane. And then he says, and I ordained you to be something in this plane. So God recognizes the reality that there are two Realities, the reality where things are settled already and the reality of this realm where that which is settled here is carried out here. You're going to get I told you it's kind of hard. So, so we're dealing with, as humans, we're dealing with, at all times, we're dealing with two different realities. The reality where it is so. And the reality where that which is so is walked out. The dimension of time and the dimension of timelessness. You and I were not created in the dimension of time. We were manifest in the dimension of time. We were created in the dimension of timelessness. We were created in the image of God. And God transcends time and so do you. And not only do you transcend time, but the fullness of who you shall be transcends time. So alignment, watch this, is when we study to find ourselves in this moment connected to where we should be according to that moment. I got to say that better. I got to say that better. So, so God has already seen you. He has already seen your end. God perceives the end from the beginning. So the decisions that God makes, he doesn't make based on or motivated by the beginning. When God makes decisions, he is motivated by the end of the thing because he sees in completion. Can I talk to you like this today? God sees in completion and he speaks in completion. The challenge is we manifest in time and space. So there is this, you know, that song we wrote, there's no distance, no delay. There, the distance and delay is between what he knows and when we perceive it. And oftentimes we struggle because we only perceive it when it shows up. But when it shows up, that's just manifestation. That's not when it's real. It's real when it's spoken to you. And we have to get to a place where we don't need manifestation to have joy. We don't need manifestation to have hope. All we need to know is that this is what God said because that means it is settled in heaven and it will soon be established in the earth. If you know what I'm saying, holler back at me this morning. And so, and so alignment is about that consciousness and trying to position ourselves, trying to find ourselves in these moments as 
the individual who was created outside of the moment. I got to say that better. It's the hardest thing in the world to do is, is bring heavenly truths down here. Alignment is when I say, God, I want to be where you have ordained me to be in this moment because this moment is connected to my future. So, so today, I want to talk about, I want to talk about the power of the present moment. Now, when I, when, I'm, when I say the present moment, I'm talking about two things. When I say the present moment, I'm talking about the present moment, a.k.a. now. But I'm also talking about the present moment as in the moment that you are present in. Because, because you can experience, or let me, let me rephrase that, you can be in a present moment and be absent from the moment and not experience the power of the moment that you're in. So, so when, I'm, when I'm calling it the present moment, I'm not just talking about the present, I'm talking about the power of a moment where you and I have brought all of ourselves, we are accounted for in that moment. Feel the Spirit of God. Can I teach today? Because, because some of us are absent in the present. Even right now. You're here. One of the most frustrating things in Scripture was Jesus. When Jesus walked about in Scripture, every time he showed up, there was power present to heal, to provide for, to deliver, to set free. But not, not everyone could experience it. And the reason why not everyone could, exper could not experience it, although it was available, is because they were not fully present. Can I teach today? So, so what we're going to do is today we're, we're going to discover paradigms, perspectives, and, and garner tools that will allow us not to miss what every moment is pregnant with. Feel the Holy Spirit. Moments are not empty. They are pregnant. The only thing that God gives us in life are moments. Watch this. God does not give you future. <laughs> You're like, wait, hold up, Pastor. One of your favorite passages of Scripture is Jeremiah 29 11, which says, For I know the thoughts that I have for you. I know the plans that I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a future and a hope. Yes, that is all true. But God gives your future packaged in now. Because when your future shows up, you're not going to call it your future. You're going to call it now. So what God gives you is now. He does not give you future. He gives you now. And we have to steward now. Feel the Holy Spirit. We've got to store it now because my future is in my now. Are you tracking with me? So, so, so I have to bring all of myself. And, 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 and I just, I got a lot of ground to cover. And what, what ultimately I want to get us to do is I want us to learn how to bring all of ourselves in that present moment so that we can receive what is in that moment because every moment has within it the opportunity for you to be edified. Okay? So, so edification is a term. You, you see it in the scripture, and it's an architecture term. It talks, it talks about our term. It talks about us being uh, built up, right? It talks about, um, you know, like for example, in you study this on your own, but in 1 Corinthians 14, it talks about prophecy coming to you. And one of the things that happens when prophecy comes to you or something God speaks forth unto you in the various ways that he speaks, one of the things that it says is, it says that when prophecy comes to you, it edifies you. It comes for edification. It comes for three things, edification, exhortation, and comfort. Study that on your own. But the first thing and the most important thing, I believe, is that when God's word comes to you, it comes to you to edify you. That is an architect, architectural term, and it speaks to you being built up. Here's what I mean. Before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. So I saw something. Before I created you, I saw something. I didn't create you randomly and say, oh, well, let's see what he or she becomes. No, I determined what you would become, and that is what motivate, motivated me to produce you. 
right? So, so God has a plan. He is the potter. We are the clay. He has an idea in his mind of who we are and what we are to become. But he also knows that he has to shape us, right? In this realm, it is so. In this realm, it is becoming. So the way that he helps us to become is in moments of edification, he brings something to us that puts another layer of building on the structure that he has created. And if I don't bring myself into the moment, I cannot be edified. And edification is not always manifestation. Oftentimes, edification is maturation. So, so, so what we struggle with is, is we don't see what we believe we should see on the outside, and we assume that there's nothing happening. But how many of us know the greatest thing that God can ever do for you is not what God do, does outside of you. It's what God, come on, it's what God does inside of you because your insides will determine your outsides because you are spirit. If you are spirit, shout, I'm spirit. You're spirit. You're spirit. So, so let's, let's, let's dig into this a little bit. The average person rarely brings themselves, or rather all of themselves, into the present moment. Straight up. The best of us rarely bring all of ourselves into the present moment. We have, instead of present moments, the majority of our moments are distracted moments. I'm going to teach today. We're going to go on a journey. The majority of our moments are distracted moments. All of the best of us, right? And not only do we struggle to bring our full selves into the present moment, but we often bring unprofitable influences into the moment with us. So there's some in here right now, and, and we're experiencing moments right now, but the reality of it is some of you have brought some things into the moment so that you can't even fully be present in the moment and receive the power of the moment because I'm telling you, there's a grace in this moment right now to change your life forever, to open you up unlike ever before and to bring you into things that transcend anything you would even know to pray for right now in this moment. But the challenge is oftentimes we're bringing other things in the moment with us. Things that I like to call unprofitable influences. Things are competing in the moment. And let me explain what, what some of those common ones are. Stress. And I'm going to talk about that before we wrap up today. Anxiety, right? Like right here in this present moment. We're there and so is anxiety. <laughs> Taken away. See, when I'm not fully present in the moment, I cannot fully receive everything that's in the moment. The moment is pregnant. Oh, I feel it. See, remember, if God doesn't give you future, if all he gives you is moments, then that means that he gives you pregnant moments. A moment is not a moment. There's something in the moment. And, 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 and God in his wisdom, who says, I'll supply all of your need, understands what you need in the moment. But if you're not present, you can't grasp What's there? So we bring, we bring our buddies. We bring some of our familiar friends. Our present moment is so crowded with things like anxiety, like stress, like, like, like fear. Here's one, like offense. Now, maybe we can talk about that. Let me just stop right there. If there's one thing that I am not going to bring into my pregnant moment, the moment that God said is good enough to take care of me and to bless me and to prosper, the one thing I'm not going to bring is you. And when I say you, I'm talking about someone who offended me. Oh, you got it. I'm going to take a minute right here. Some of us can't even pray real good. We can't even be present in the moment real good because we're thinking about that person and secretly wishing mm, that, mm, I don't know, maybe their plane crashes. No, you're not that sinister. Their tire goes flat, something like that. Whatever it is that, 
that would bring you some sort of satisfaction. Secret, chuckle. But truly, offense oftentimes is one of those things that prohibits us from being fully present in the moment. I'm not bringing, if you heard me, I'm not gonna bring you into my blessing. My present moment is my blessing. I wanna leave you there. I'm gonna forgive you. Hey, I'm, we are good. Trust me, nothing is worth, worth me missing everything that God has for me in the moment. I'm just trying to give you some practical things that we bring into moments. And so our moments are often sometimes so crowded, watch this, they're so crowded that we can miss the movement that is inherent in each moment, in each moment. If you think about the word momentum, and you understand what momentum is, you can't even have momentum without moments. Hmm. You, you gain momentum by your effective stewardship of moments. Oh, I feel the Holy Spirit. Let, let, let me read it the way I wrote it. There's always movement in a moment, and if you steward it well, that movement that's in a moment that you experience when you bring all of yourself to the moment will carry you places that are exceedingly abundantly far above what you can ever imagine. So, so to be direct, how you perceive your moment is critical. I am very, very, very protective over my moments. I've learned that, that all I've got is my moment. My shot is in my moment. My restoration is in my moment. My peace is in my moment. My prosperity is in my moment. My creativity, the best of my creativity is in my moment. So I am a guard dog over my moment. That's why you should never call me. My friends know to text me, maybe, but don't, 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 don't call me. Because here's, let me just tell you something, to, to the person who is not here but watching via live stream, no one, no one really appreciates when you call them. I'm not even going to talk to you, I'm looking at the camera. Look at the camera. No, be, because, because, because you, when you call somebody, you are automatically interrupting. See, see, I'm helping somebody because you're with that person today, right? So you didn't have the courage to say it. I'm going to say it for you, right? Very few times does anyone say, oh, thank you for interrupting me. What is it? We have to be, I am so protective over my moments. Watch this. I even protect my moments from me. I'm serious. If, if I'm in this moment and I'm aligned with God and I'm right where I want to be and Ture tries to introduce another thought to Ture, I get mad at Ture. Ture. Don't you see I'm in my moment? Are you tracking with me? See, when you see moments right, man, you get, woo, you get viciously Protective, and if you're not protective over your moments, something's wrong with you. And that sounded so harsh. Uh, you have an area of growth. <laughs> no, if, if I see my moment right, and I say, I don't, I don't have a future, right? I don't possess it, right? God's got it for me, but I don't possess it. The only thing that I possess is my now. And, and I have to bring myself fully there. I am battling against those things that try to come in. You know, one of the other things that we bring into a moment that crowds the moment and keeps us from being fully present, and this is a tricky one, diversified vision. Too, too, many, too many visions. You know, we used to applaud our, t I remember when the term multitask first came out. And you, it would almost be something, if you were looking for a job, you put that on your resume. And I multitask, multitask very well. <laughs> I don't want to hire a multitasker because a multitasker is typically pretty average across the board because you've got to bring all of yourself to one thing in order to manifest the greatness 
that is in that thing. I don't want to multitask. And so sometimes the enemy of your soul doesn't have to kill you. All the enemy of your soul has to do is diversify your vision. See, there, there are God things and there are good things. It's one of the things that I'm learning. And so, so if I were trying to bring you to a place of mediocrity and I could control your thoughts, I would bring you, at, once I saw you lock in to that one good thing that will manifest everything that God saw before he put you in your mother's womb, I would bring to you four additional good things. And that's the tricky part because they're good things, right? Who doesn't want to do a good thing? But, but I wasn't created to do good things. I was created to do God things. I was created to align with God's vision for my life. And watch this. If I do God things, good things will come out of me. Are you tracking with me? Let, let's, 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 go, let's go a tad, a tad further. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you. If you're taking notes, write this down. We're going to turn a corner here. Bringing all of yourself into a moment necessitates the foundation of sufficiency. Say it again. To bring all of yourself into a moment necessitates the foundation of sufficiency. There's a passage in 2 Corinthians 9, verse 8. I love it. It says, and, and God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you, all, always having, look at this, always having all sufficiency, always having all sufficiency in all things. Did you see that? Look at that flow. Look at, look at that language. Always having. In other words, there's never a moment that you do not have this. All sufficiency. That means that you lack nothing, Right? In all things. Oh, that's a beautiful promise right there. Hear it again. Hear it again. Hear it again. Always having. That means that there's never a moment that I do not have this. All sufficiency. That means that I lack nothing in all things. May have an abundance for every good work. J just tell somebody, I'm loaded already. I'm, I'm loaded. I'm loaded already. I'm loaded already. And this brings us back, this brings me back to, to a thought from verse 23. Here's the thought. If you're taking notes, write this down. The consciousness of need is a distraction when it is based in the mindset of a deficit. Yeah, I guess this. The consciousness of need is a distraction when it is based in the mindset of a deficit. What I'm saying is I'm not saying that there is no such thing as need. What I am saying is that all of your needs have been supplied. So, so in Psalm 23, in verse 1, look at what it says. So David says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Now, there's another translation of that verse that I think speaks to it better. It says, the Lord is my shepherd, therefore I have no lack. <laughs> when you come into your present moment with a mentality of lack or a mentality that says that I am deficient, I do not have something, if my mind tells me that I am less, I cannot bring my all into the moment. Oh, you got, I, I got it. This, this is, if you don't get anything else, this is the point that you have to get. A, a lack mentality does not allow me to bring all of myself into the present moment because since I'm thinking that way, there is a part of my consciousness that is frantically scrambling for remedy because I know that I'm not supposed to be in need. So I can't bring all of myself to the moment to experience the provision that God has for me in that moment, sometimes even to give me the wisdom and the strategy to fulfill whatever need that is because I have 
disbelieved that God is my shepherd, and as a result of it, I have to be my own shepherd, and now Jesus Jr. is working in a moment completely distracted from the reality that in that moment is everything I need. So there's some in here, and you can't even receive the word. Not you, I'm sorry. Some watching on live stream right now, and you can't even receive the word because you're not open because 50% of you is trying to work out a solution to a problem that God has already provided a solution for in the moment that you're standing in. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you today? Are you hearing the words that are coming out of my mouth? Everything that you need is in this present moment. So be present. Be present. Just turn to somebody and say, snap out of it. So what we're seeing in Psalm 23 is the consciousness that produces us being fully present in the present moment. The Lord is my shepherd, I I shall not want. Look at this, it's amazing. The Lord is my shepherd, I I shall not want. He leads me beside the stars. The still waters, or he leads me to, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. He he leads me beside the still waters. He he restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness. That's alignment for his name's sake. Look at this. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Now that's that's really interesting. That's really interesting. Because if you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death in the present moment. Naturally speaking, you should bring fear with you. Let's just keep it 100, right? That's a scary place, right? It's a scary place. It's the, the valley of the shadow of death, right? But he says, even in that moment, in that scary moment, I'm not going to bring fear into that moment with me. Because you are with me, right? Right? See, when you're fully present in the moment, you can recognize that there's a difference between actual death and the shadow of death. A shadow, if you think about it, remember back in the day, I don't know if you ever did this or whatever, but you would get a light behind you and you would make monsters with your fingers, right? And it would project an image and you'd scare your sibling or whatever, but it would project an image that looked like a monster, but it wasn't really a monster. It was just your fingers. Shadows project things that are greater than what they are. Are, are you understand what I'm saying? So, so this, this mentality that David is walking in is he's basically saying, because I understand who God is, I can bring all of myself into every present moment. Can we go further? So when I come into each moment, when I come into each moment, I have to come into the moment with a sufficiency mentality. I think one of the reasons why some who desire spouses, they got real quiet. Amen, Pastor. Ooh, 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 ooh. He's coming for me. I, I think that one of the reasons why God holds back mates from us is because If we step into that present moment feeling like, I don't have what I need. I need a boo. I I need. (laughs) Then you're not bringing all of yourself to the moment. And you are basically telling God that he is not good. See, when you have a deficiency mentality, you are basically telling God that he is not a good shepherd. Because if you were a good shepherd, I would have my boo and my bins. Seriously. 
Think about that. When I don't bring all of myself, because there's a part of me that feels like I'm maimed or marred or lacking, I am telling God that God is not intelligent and that he is not good, that he is a deadbeat God. And that's why it isn't until, as a single person, that you can step into the present moment saying, the Lord is my shepherd, I have no lack. He's not even gonna manifest a spouse or a mate because they will become more to you than what they're supposed to be. I have to become sufficient first. When I become sufficient in the present moment, I'm telling you everything that God has in store for you is going to show up in your life. If you believe it, take 10 seconds and give God praise in this house. Uh-huh. Bring all of yourself in the moment. God, if you want me to be single for this season, I don't even look at it as single. I'm whole, baby. I'm sufficient, baby. I think, I think, I think I want to, I think I want to take the word single out of the believer's vocabulary. No, I'm not single. I'm sufficient, baby. I'm sufficient. And when you are able to declare from the depths of who you are and every moment you show up in that you are sufficient, you're going to attract all of the blessings of God to your life. I have no lack. I have no lack. I have no lack. If it's not there, it means I don't need it. I have no lack. I have no lack. When I need it, it will show up. I have no lack. I have no lack. I have no lack. I have no lack. Get that out of my head. I am enough. I have enough. Because God is all. And he's my God. He is my shepherd. And David, David was the perfect person to say that. Because David, by trade, was actually a shepherd. You remember David? He was the shepherd boy. He cared for his sheep. He fed his sheep. He led his sheep. He fought off the enemies of his sheep. Remember that? He, he fought a lion, right, and a bear. He didn't fight the lion and the bear for himself. He fought the lion and the bear because they were trying to take his sheep. They were trying to harm his sheep. And this is why, watch this, David, he so had a sufficiency mentality that he, he runs up on Goliath without fear at all. Goliath was so much bigger than him. Goliath was shaking the armies of Israel. And David walks up. He doesn't hesitate. He's not afraid at all. He's like, let's go. You don't want none of this. Because he had a sufficiency mentality. Therefore, David was the perfect voice. He was the perfect, the perfect, well, he's so excited over there. He was the perfect, the perfect voice to, to perceive God as a shepherd. When he says it, he means it. I shall not want. The same way that I, as a shepherd-hearted human being, took care of the sheep. I fought for them. I provided for them. I fed them. I let, I didn't allow them to lack anything. My God will do the same for me. And therefore, I have no lack. Now, it's going to take me a couple of weeks to unpack this. But I do want to say something about stress in particular that I believe is pertinent. And the reason why I pull stress out, and I could talk about all these, and maybe I will over time. But the reason why I want to really take a moment and talk about stress is because stress can literally kill you. Yeah. It can literally kill you. And that's one of the things that we bring into our present moments. Not only does it rob us from, from everything that is in that moment, but it, 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 can, it, can, it can literally kill us. And, and here's why stress is a no-no 
First of all, humans were not wired to be stressed. Why is, you know, how, why, if, if stress is a normal part of life, then, then why does it make us sick? Uh, let me just tell you something right now. Anything that makes you sick is not for you. <laughs> Hello, somebody. But we weren't wired, we weren't wired to have stress. We were created, watch this, we were created in the consciousness of abundance. If you go back to the very beginning, First man, the first woman, the first human, Adam, was not born in the consciousness of lack at all, right? Because everything was prepared for Adam before he got there. And I should say before they got there because Adam was both he and she. Y'all not ready for that? That's another teaching, but they, boom. They. I feel like digressing, but I'm going to stay focused here. Okay? They were produced in the consciousness of abundance, I believe that's probably why it was easy for them to disobey the Lord. Think about it. If all you know is abundance, and he comes and he, and he says, hey, if you eat this, you're going you're gonna to experience lack. They're like, what is lack? Watch this. So they did not have the consciousness of lack. This is what we were originally created into. We were created in the consciousness of abundance without the consciousness of lack. And that's why it affects our body when we have stress. There was nothing to stress over. We were not wired to stress. Are you tracking with me? But let's take it a little deeper. I'm going to take it a little deeper. If you're taking notes, write this down. As a result of what I just described, stress is an alien entity to your divine self. It's not supposed to be there. And if you're taking notes, write this down. Stress is the evidence of the need for structure, internally, externally, and sometimes both. Stress is the evidence of the need for structure. Let's, let's take it out, let's, let's put it in the business world. Whenever I, am, I feel some stress or some irritation in any of my businesses or organizations, that lets me know that I have a structure problem. I, I've got the wrong person, in the right place, there's a competence issue, or I don't have a system enough because, because stress, it, 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 it's screaming out at you that something is not structured properly, right? That, that's, if you come to the call of leaders, I'll, I'll talk more about that. Anyway, shameless plug for that seminar. But anyway, in your business, that's for free. When there's an area that you just keep stressing over, that means you need to go revisit that area and perhaps hire somebody or fire somebody or restructure somebody or give them a process or give them a system because when you don't have structure, it creates stress. That was for free. But that's external structure. There's also, when you have stress, there's also an indication that you have some internal structure that needs to be worked through. And so when I talk about internal structure, I'm talking about the discipline of perspective. Feel that. The discipline of perspective, right? So I have to regulate and always ensure the health of my perspective. And if I do not, I will have stress. Oh, I feel it. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I have to... I have to align my insides with healthy perspectives, perspective, and I've got to stay at it. Like, for example, I don't, like, I don't study for messages. My process, my process of pre preparing for, message, for messages is an internal process, and I make certain that my internal structure, mind, spirit, and body is healthy. And 98% of that has to do with perception, how I'm seeing things. And because what that does is it creates a channel through which God can flow. God can flow. If I have chaos inside, the message is going to be chaos to you. God can't flow, right, because I'm not structured spiritually. Are you tracking with me? And how I perceive has everything to do with it. So when I'm stressing, that means that I have not worked my disciplines. Meditation. Prayer. 
study. All of these things are designed to produce the type of inner structure that will alleviate stress and allow you to be completely present in the moment. There's a couple things I want to say about stress, and I'm going to land the plane. Now, here's what you have to understand about God and how he resources. So remember, God doesn't give us the future. All God gives us is moments, which means that, if you're taking notes, write this down. God resources us day by day and moment by moment. In other words, God does not resource you for tomorrow in today. And maybe he set that structure up to keep us dependent on him. Because you know we get a little rebellious. Come on. We get, when something happens to you, we get all spiritual. Let me tell you something. Let a crisis happen. You will be... Oh, my God, you will be the saint of all saints. <laughs> How do I know that God resources us day by day, moment by moment? It's because even when the disciples asked Jesus to teach them how to pray, he says, pray like this. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, it will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us what? This day, what? <laughs> Daily bread. In other words, the resources for today are in today. Tomorrow's resources are not in today's moment. Now, you say, Pastor, what does that have to do with stress? Typically, what you're stressing out is something that is stressing over is something that's in the future. Some of you are stressing over bills that aren't even due yet. Hello? Some of you are stressing over something that is impending. And that's a problem. Because you don't even need it right now. You're stressed because it's coming. Well, when it shows up, God will show up because the resources that God gives you are for the moments that you experience. Are you hearing what I'm saying today? Give us this day our daily bread. God provides resources moment by moment. And so what happens is, what stress is, is when you bring tomorrow's worry, you got it, into today's moment. And we weren't wired that way, and that's why it makes us sick. Last thing I'll say about that. Even Jesus... The only time you see Jesus struggling and frustrated almost to the point that he could not even receive was when, watch this, he had the pressure of the cross, although he was in the garden. You got to catch this. You got to catch it. You got to catch it. You got to catch it. He wasn't at the cross. He was worried about the cross in the garden. Fill this with somebody. And he struggles in the garden over the agony of the cross. It was too soon. And he's overwhelmed. And then somehow he found alignment. And he says, nevertheless, not my will be done, but your will be done. And he gets up because all he needed was the strength to get up in the garden. And the cross would take care of itself. somebody's word. All you need is what you need for this moment. And in order to real, see, this will change your life. This will allow you to bring all of yourself. The Lord is my shepherd. I have no lack. I don't even have the consciousness of lack. I have the consciousness of abundance. I know, I know. There's a Hebrew word that was translated no. It's the Hebrew word yada, and it, is, it means no, but it also means to, you know, for, you know, to come together. You know, I don't know how to put it, but to come together intimately, right? To experience, for two people to experience each other in the deepest way. Okay, that's all you're getting, all right? This is PG-13, okay? So, so, so there's the idea there then that to know is to be so convinced that you are experiencing the thing that you know. So, so 
the consciousness or the knowledge of sufficiency or abundant is not a hope. Abundance is not a hope. It's not a wish. When you really have the consciousness of something, you experience it even before it manifests itself. The Lord is my shepherd. I have no lack. And it works in the other direction as well. If I have the consciousness of lack, I experience lack. And as a man thinks, so is he. I want to show you something. Last thing I want to show you. If I said that already, that's what preachers do. <laughs> in that last verse in David's psalm of sufficiency, he says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And then he says, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And I looked up that word dwell because that word dwell was just jumping out at me. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And by the way, Solomon built the temple, which means that David was not talking about a physical dwelling. He was talking about alignment in the presence of God. I will dwell in the presence and the consciousness of God. I will dwell. And that word dwell, does that make sense? Okay. And that word dwell jumped out at me. It jumped out. I'm like, dwell? What, dwell, what is this? I, I need to study that word. So I looked up that word that was translated dwell there, and it's the word sub, it's a Hebrew word, and it means to turn back with the idea of returning to a starting point. So he says, I, I will dwell. This whole psalm, this whole song of David, is David basically presenting to us the consciousness that he walked in that made him great. And it was all based on the Lord being his shepherd. He was present in every moment, even dark moments, even the valley of the shadow of death. He was present in the moment because God was with him, which meant that he was covered, which meant that he was all good. Okay? And then he closes this thing, though. He closes it by saying, and I will, I will dwell in, essentially, the presence of the Lord, and that means to turn back with the idea of returning to the starting point. I'm like, God, what are you saying? And he says, in order to maintain this, this present in the present moment consciousness, you're going to have to develop the discipline of continuing to go back to the consciousness of sufficiency. In other words, you're not going to just get this one time. So, so what God is doing now is he's giving you perspective and he's giving you tools, but you're going to have to work. See, notice he says, and I will dwell. This is a decision to pursue, to embrace the mentality of sufficiency so that when you step into the moment, you will undoubtedly be fully there. And so what I want to do is I want to pray for some people right now. And if you're here... And in fact, I want everyone to stand real quick. We're almost done. If you're here and you know that the Lord is speaking to you and he's trying to produce something greater in you, he's trying to give you a tool, you're already coming. I love it. He's trying to give you tools and perspectives that... It's so much more than alleviating stress. We were created for moments. In fact, let me, let me even fine tune that thought. We were created for the moment that we're in. For the moment that we're in. The only thing that matters is the moment that you're in. Am I saying, hey, you, you need to be irresponsible, you shouldn't think about the future? No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying steward your moment. If you steward your moment well, the future will take care of itself. Are you tracking with me? This is something. Jesus talked about this in Matthew chapter 6, 33. He says, don't worry about tomorrow. He says, tomorrow will take care of itself. Be present. And earlier in that chapter, he was talking about stop worrying about what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink or what you're going to wear. He says, stop fretting over things that I've already provided. He says, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. 
And all other things are going to be added unto you. In other words, I am an intelligent God, says God. I'm intelligent. I wouldn't form you and create you and then drop you off and abandon you. I'm not a deadbeat God. I'm unlike any human that you've ever experienced. I am a good shepherd. And my sheep lack nothing. Lack is an illusion. It's an illusion when the Lord is your shepherd. And so if you're here, and I want you to get as close to this altar as you can, I'm going to pray for you. Because I believe that, that this is taught, but it's also caught, caught. And as you say, yes, God, I want this. See, God wouldn't bring you into a teaching. He wouldn't bring you into a revelation. He wouldn't bring you into an insight unless that was going to become your new normal. Remember, he's an architect. And because you were able to get present in this moment, you're being built which means that you're getting something that's going to allow you to, to the next degree, look more like what God saw before he put you in your mother's womb. So if you're here and it's resonating, I want you to come meet me at this altar to get as close as you can. I'm going to pray for you. Now, to be fair, to be fair, I think it's absolutely impossible for you to bring all of yourself into a moment without the knowledge of the good shepherd. That's an unfair thing to ask. Because what brings, what gives you the freedom to believe that you're sufficient is based on the character of the one that you put your trust in. So if you are here and you say, Pastor, I, I want to know God. I, I just, because none of this makes sense if you don't know God. If you don't understand the character of God, the nature of God. If you're here and... Clearly, God has touched you in this moment. He's touched you because when God touches you, he touches you in a way oftentimes that transcends your intellect. He'll stimulate your intellect, but he'll reach right past that and touch your spirit and your soul. That's what he does. He gets into places that nobody can get into, right? He'll go through your head, but he'll end up at your heart. And if you're here in this moment and your heart is touched, I feel that for some of you. I'm going to tell you exactly what you feel like. You, you... You've been touched so deep that you could almost cry. You, you're emotional, and you don't even know why you're emotional, but you are. And, and you have been touched, and you can't explain it. And there is a need, an internal need, that is being met right now. And you're kind of fighting it because you don't want to lose it. You're kind of like, you know, you don't want to, wow, I'm here in this building. I'm in there, and all these people around me, and I don't want to lose it. And I hear God saying, you're safe. We got you. God's got you. And you're safe. Because... I'm going to explain to you what's happening. What God is doing is he's dismantling the false confidence that you had to build up because of pain and because of a sense of survival. You felt like, essentially, you had to be your own shepherd. And the love of God is touching you. And it's hitting you right now, and you almost want to cry, and you feel emotional, and you, you're afraid because you, 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 you feel like you're going to be weak. You're not being weak. You're getting ready to be stronger than you've ever been right now you're, before. You're being vulnerable. And God needs your vulnerability. If that's you, and I just described you, and I know you're here, and that's several of you, come down and get to the altar. That's God saying he knows where you are. He knows what you're going to. Get down here. Come on. Come on. Get down here. I don't know you. I don't know your life like that. I'm not inside you. But God does. God does. And that's God saying, I see you. I see you. And I'm getting ready to change your life. I'm getting ready to change your life. And I love you. Says God. And I love you too. But he, I can't love you the way he does. He's saying, I'm your shepherd. Before I put you in your mother's womb, I knew you. I knew you. And the truth of the matter is, I'm the only one that really knows you, knows you. Because I, I know who you're becoming. I feel that. There's some people attached to who you were. There's some people attached to who you think you are. And God says, I'm, I'm attached to who I know you are. Who I know you are. That's why we need to be in relationship so that I can show you who you are. And you will never, you will never be able to perceive yourself properly if you have the consciousness of lack. The Lord is my shepherd. Shall not one. Father, I thank you for this moment. We thank you for this moment that you brought us into. 
a moment that only you could. And we, we love you so much. Nobody like you. Thank you for the love that you have for your sons and daughters that's constantly and consistently demonstrated in the way that you touch us and you feed us and you lead us and you bless us. Father, there, there's some in here right now. We're, we're at this altar as a sign of surrender. We're drawing near to you, God. You sent your word to us and your word met us. You sent it to us. And now we're drawing into it and we're saying, God, I need what you are providing in this moment. In this moment. The consciousness of sufficiency. That I might be present with you in every moment. In every moment. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not lack. Father, there's some here who you have touched in a profoundly deep way. In a way that will change their life forever. They'll never be the same again because of what you've done on the inside of them. And Father, there's a grace in this moment, an opportunity to open up and receive you as a friend, as a shepherd, in a way that we never have before, that we might come to that place where David found himself in, where he said, the Lord is my shepherd. I don't even know lack. Hallelujah. I thank you that you're doing that. As the hearts are being opened right now, those who are saying yes to you and opening up their souls to you, God, I thank you that you will do the very thing you promised to do. You said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, as many have in this room, as many have are watching via live stream, you said that I will come in and I will sup with them and them with me. We'll have an exchange. They'll sit at my table. And when they sit at my table, they're safe, even in the presence of those enemies. We love you, God. I just want you to repeat after me, Heavenly Father, I thank you for this moment. I receive what's in this moment. I thank you for your word. You spoke to me. It's obvious you know me. And therefore, I receive the word. I thank you for Jesus. Thank you for making him who had no sin, all of mine, all of my weakness, all of my deficiencies, all of my lack, all of my limitations, you placed in his body, nailed it to the cross, and put it to death. And just as he was raised up, free and victorious because I'm in him I'm raised up too above my limitations above lack above deficiency I'm raised in you and you are my sufficiency I lack nothing Holy Spirit fill me up in every place where there may be a void. God yourself, feel it. I receive that too. And I will go from glory to glory because I commit today to fight for my moments, to protect my moments because you will meet me and you will build me in every moment that I am present in. Being present in the moment is my new normal. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on. Let's give God a big old shout for what he's doing in our hearts, for what he's doing in our lives, for what he's doing in our minds, for what he's doing in our souls. I thank you, God, that you're sealing this. Now we're going to walk it out. David said, I will dwell. I will continue to return. I'm going to be careful when that doubt tries to come in, when stress about something that's two weeks down the road tries to come in. Uh-uh, devil, uh-uh. Right here, right now, in this moment, I'm good. I'm good. Hallelujah.